good crying. I know. <laughs> and before I start, I'm, I'm going to tell everyone I was crying a little bit with Murray. <laughs> It's okay to cry. It's, it everyone is. Cry a little bit about stuff. It um, is. <laughs> okay. Um, everybody, Mirage Trams again. I'm so okay. excited to have her. Um, I'm Amy Gerlich, and we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about some improv centric things that we can be doing uh, for in inclusivity. And oh, that was the other thing. I'm going to write it down and tell you the other thing that I'm planning on doing because I. This is what I'm really excited about, and uh, um, okay, sorry. Derp. My brain has been not working well. Um, so I want to talk to you, Maraj. You were, uh, we're going to talk about improv stuff and inclusivity, and also her experience lately with the uh, flow of how everything is going with all the theaters. Um, Oh, and uh, I know I said in the chat while you were talking to Huey, my friend Corey, so he's not on Facebook. He's, um, he's, um, you're, you're muted. Yeah. That's okay. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I said a whole bunch. No, I didn't say, I didn't say, I just said, yeah. <laughs> he, um, I connected you guys on, through Twitter, so he's actually... Uh, and he made it sound like he was just like, yeah, he talked to me about my experience at UCB, but he's actually part of the committee to do all the changes. Oh. That's, that's why I wanted to put you in contact. Oh, okay, great. Dope. Okay. Let and, me check uh, out Twitter. I'm hardly on Twitter. I need to be more on Twitter. I was in like Twitter jail or something. Like I couldn't get into Twitter for a while. <laughs> so, now I, I guess I'm free. It's yeah. weird. <laughs> in your DMs. He DM'd you back. Cool, cool. Uh, in case you haven't gotten anything from UCB. So speaking about that, um, I was watching you and Huey and you both were really frustrated about the fact that some of these bigger theaters weren't moving quick enough or weren't responding to what is going on and the changes and what's happening. Right. So I know a lot of small market people feel the same way. Um, and I want you just to kind of speak on that. Like, uh, I didn't get to watch the whole thing that you guys were talking about. I'm going to go back mm -hmm. and watch it later. But did you guys, did anything happen from that point till now? Did you hear back from any of the theaters? Okay, so the, the main theater that we've been hearing, well, I have heard from some theaters. Um, you know, Pack Theater, uh, Comedy Sports, um, and of course, Second City. Those are the main three that will provide uh, communication on different levels, I'll mm -hmm. say. Um, yeah, what, one thing that we've kind of had to deal with is the idea of what change does look like um, or what is expected um, and that the change that is asked for, like the things that we're asking for you know, you can implement those changes, but that also has to do with the deeper level of change. Sometimes you have to restructure what you have there, or you have to make sure you're listening to your community, or you have to just realize, like, be able to first identify where there's a problem without it having to escalate to this place where there's legal stuff involved or where people are severely damaged. I think that the theaters need to understand that this isn't just improv, it's not just comedy, it's not just theater, it's not just performance. Everyone tries to minim, uh, minimize that kind of thing. And what I see is that this is a part of our lives that affects us, that that part of our life that affects us can affect the people that we're around. So every, this is a, it's all about this ripple effect and all of the people who accept, this is just how things go. And this is what we have to experience. And it just sucks. That, that can't be because it, it, you take this throughout the rest of your life. And we have to be people too. We have to be, we have to be people and we have to encourage other artists that want to live in the world of just being people to want to be part of this community too. Yeah. So are you guys, um, what, what would be the dream? Uh, what would be the dream? Like if, you, if you could have anything, 
Um, I know speed, obviously, like it would be great if everything happened really, really quickly, but you know, as, as uh, someone who's trying to attempt that on such a smaller scale, um, I almost feel like I don't want to be updating all the time because I don't want it to feel like, hey, look, look at what we're doing. Like, I'm, I'm kind of going at a very fast pace, but I'm not exploiting it. I, and yeah. people ask, I'm very open to talking about what changes we're trying to make. Mm -hmm. so, Let's hear what your dream, what would your dream be if all of the theaters, if you just emailed them right now and they came back to you, what, what would that look like for changes from them? Okay, this is something that I, I've uh, thought about a lot. This is why I don't sleep. This is why there's Insomnia Club. Um, because the, the way that things, I mean, for me, just, and I'm not gonna speak for Huey, I'm not gonna speak for Hollywood Accountability right now, I'm just speaking for me. Um, I think that it is about because it can't be just change this or change that person or change this practice because we're talking about an institutionalized change right so this is when i talk about institutionalized change i was talking to huey about this and i was like well, oh. she froze let's just all look at how beautiful she looks right now though right Maybe she'll pop back on. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm gonna stop it. I'll start recording again when she comes back. I, somebody doesn't want me to say something. Right? I was, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> I go, let's just all look at how pretty she looks right <laughs> now. <laughs> like, in this perfect. I was, I needed to think a little bit like, <laughs> that's okay um i'll 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 splice these together yeah <laughs> um, but you froze right around where you said i'm not going to speak for anybody else but this is how i feel right now oh right okay um oh d and did we talk about the um the store analogy and all that kind of stuff did <laughs> you get it? oh you didn't hear that oh. no froze right as you were about to speak wow government. okay that's ugh. come on. okay <laughs> So <laughs> this is how I feel about it. Um, that is, it's not anybody else's. So when we go to the, well, I was talking to Huey about this. And when we go to the grocery store, you know, as a, as when we go to the grocery store, we don't say, how do we get this, this food from the store to my home? We don't have to ask that kind of question. You know, and we, we know that there's this, this process, there's this ritual or whatever that we go in, get a basket, take the food, put it in the basket, go check out. And, you know, the, the person's there, we give them the stuff, they give us a bag, we take it home. That's because we, that's not something we even ask our parents. You know what I mean? We don't even ask parents, like, how do I get this food? we learn it from them and they didn't ask their parents i mean unless it's something that's brand new like but we learn this and that's kind of the same structure that we have this um institutionalized um uh these institutionalized behaviors right so the if we don't ask like th th that's what people need to know is to how to identify these behaviors because we're not taught really to identify the behaviors. We're taught that the behaviors don't exist. Mm -hmm. And we're taught that the people that bring up the behaviors are wrong or troublemakers or something like that. So a lot of times we're scared if we find that we're in an uncomfortable position to bring up these issues because we know it's gonna be some kind of disruption. Um, and we, you know, and that comes from any type of injustice that's how it is. You know, we talk about um, John Lewis just dying and he would always talk about good trouble because you have to be willing to create a disruption. You know, that doesn't always have to be that, you know, it's, it's something that's horrible, but it does have to be a disruption so that things are, are, you have to point out what's wrong so that people can see the change. So all of that to say my thought is that first we have to find ways to get people to understand the actual culture 
within this environment. What happens? We can't keep trying to treat it as it comes. It's like, you know, right now it's like COVID, you know, we're just trying to come in, put everybody on a respirator and see if it works. And that's not how it's got to work. We have to find the, the actual cause and then we find the cure for that. And the only way you can do that is to have the, the uh, theaters listen to the communities because I can't even say, this is what you should do in this instance and versus that instance. Yeah. Um, it, it has to be come from the people who are in the community to tell you what it is. So these, these monthly um, uh, town halls, those type of things. Communication needs to be very open and transparent and acknowledge when there's something that's gone wrong. That is so key. I don't understand pretending that there's nothing wrong in, a, in anything. I mean, like, especially if, if we're going specifically into improv or just comedy, that's exactly what we do. We look at stuff that's weird and different and we call it out. So that needs to happen on an institutional level. Yeah. You, just need, you just need to know what's wrong first and then start to treat that from there. Right. And I mean, I think that's part of it is that uh, why people are kind of experiencing this emotional kind of almost rage because they, they're not, they shouldn't be expected to tell us how to make the change. They don't know. They've never seen it. Right. We don't know. We've, we've never, none of us have ever seen it. So we don't know what it looks like. So stop asking us what it looks like and what we want. Right. right. Um, uh, we've got to we've got to build together. I think is the point that you're trying to make as well. Oh. Um, but it's also like uh, I think I was telling you that I was rewriting the curriculum for the theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that, and I've been going over <laughs> my old because I transcribed all my classes. Oh wow! Um, so I have everything word for word that came out of the mouths of some of these legendary teachers mm -hmm. and I mean this is 2001 and I'm not gonna name names because um, I love all these people and I don't think they were doing this out of any kind of malicious yeah this this is probably how they were trained as well in Chicago but um, there is an actual thing that one of my teachers said where they were like and they were trying to make a point but the, it was the wrong way to say it and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's how we were trained. So mm -hmm. it was, um, take, a, take a gift. If, so, if somebody makes you a racist, have fun with it. And I was like, that's how we were trained. Right. You know right. what I mean? So it's like, uh, so it got me thinking, um, kind of on your point of the whole like learned behavior, grocery store kind of stuff, where I was like, well, if we change the conversation and the way we approach now, maybe over time, all of that stuff yeah. that was how we were trained will not be there anymore. And it'll be history rather than uh, the Bible, you know? So it's like, so what can I do? I, I guess I can create a curriculum that doesn't have that kind of language in it anymore that um, takes out things even little things like I was noticing there's like this big weird push especially with UCB uh classes in the beginning where it was like all about being cool all yeah. about being like you know what I mean where it's like there's mm -hmm. different <laughs> versions of cool um because I mean I came into comedy being like I know I'm cool like whatever that means like <laughs> yeah. I'm very confident I had I was the girl in school who was friends with everybody. Yeah, right. You know, dip my toes in all the different things. Uh, later to find out that, you know, certain people would make fun of me. But I would talk about it. Right. You just, yeah, but you're just like, hey. I <laughs> um, but like, uh, there's this culture of like kind of nerds or people who are picked on mm -hmm. who get these positions of power mm -hmm. and it's like give a mouse a cookie right it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. now i'm mm -hmm. gonna be the bully and yeah. then like they like oh, hurt, hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh so it is it is this i feel like there is this balance where it's like even new people coming in 
need to keep a level head and remember that it's just an improv theater. Yeah, I mean, just like, yeah, I think we were talking about this, but how about how it's, so I am starting a podcast that is called uh, Mirage's In Incomplete Guide on How Not to Give a Fuck. But yeah. it's, because, and I'm always talking about how not to give a fuck, because it's, after cancer, when you ha have cancer, you go through all this stuff, you're just like, Psh, I don't care. And you, But then it's not necessarily not caring about anything. It's prioritizing properly. It's saying what matters, you know, like my girls matter, you know, but does it matter if they come to me and they say, um, you know, I'm, uh, I am uh, transsexual. I mean, that doesn't matter because I love my girls. So that matters. So that's the kind of stuff where it's like, don't give a fuck. Like all this stuff, all the petty stuff is not what we need to worry about. We have, and we were talking about that. It was, it's like nothing matters, but also everything matters, yeah. but also nothing matters, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some people understand that, but it's like, some people are like, you don't make sense. And I can't help you because it's either, you know, you have to understand that this is life and that we're all experiencing the same, we're all on the same plane to try and be seen. And that's why theater is so great because we show the audience that we see them. Like, I see you. And they, they feel discovered. And I think that's why we are in relationships because we have to know that we, we exist. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. I don't know no. where I went off. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the whole point is like, I'm going to wait for these sirens. Mm. Oh man, I can't wait for that to be gone. <laughs> Then right the, right <laughs> um we are emulating it, it's it's not silly that you know you're kind of attacking this whole issue through big theaters because point is we're emulating behavior people mm -hmm. status relationships so it's like we should have a very kind of balanced way of doing that without judgment and i think that's the key is like that's where I'm coming at with my curriculum is taking all the good bits from all the places and things, mm -hmm. ways that I learned and things that I changed and warped around, but mm -hmm. also like um, recognizing those moments where you're like, oh, this is something I used to think was funny. Now, now why did I think yes. that's funny? Right. And, and so it's a, it's an introspective like reflection, you know, and, and I think that's where we have to, take responsibility also as the performers. What do we let get away from us? What do we accept in the beginning? Like, what is it that we are accepting right. when we're in these groups? If someone said to you, um, you know, like you're a, a woman and it's always catcalling in every scene, it starts off like this. Have you ever said anything? Have you brought it up? Not saying that that's your necessary responsibility like to that, that environment, but it's your responsibility to yourself yeah. to say that makes me feel horrible like feel those places that you feel horrible why you don't want to go to rehearsal why it is that you feel like you want to drop out of something those are the places that you need to speak up about yeah you know that and if the if if that if you're speaking up and you have a theater that's listening to that then we have change that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. You just reminded me of this like very interesting moment. So when I started it at UCB, I also um, started in an improv group with three other guys. So it was the four of us, we were called Cronf. Uh -huh. and, and we um, we had our first show. It was like crazy because we were, two, it's all three of us were living together and another one of us was living in Brooklyn. to our first indie show and it felt very different to me than rehearsals because one of the members every character he made me uh dumb he called me a bitch at one point and like i went i was like behind the curtain and like me amy started crying and i immediately after the show was like visibly upset and they were all kind of like what's wrong and i i just said it 
And that, I was like, I don't ever want to be called a bitch on stage. Mm, I don't ever want to yes. be made a prostitute. Like, all of these things that you guys have never yeah, right. done to me. It was only one person. And, like, it, I was like, I'm going at this. This is a group that I am passionate about. And it, we yeah. had been real young. Um, and they got, in, well, the guy I was, I was talking, speaking to about it got very upset. And it was mm. like, this on the streets of New York mm -hmm. and the other two were sitting there like what is happening and then he like ran away which was hilarious because he was running to our apartment that <laughs> I had to go to and then the other one of my other guys on the group just looked at me and goes you just ruined everything <laughs> I was like so I had this and I had to like process this on my way home on the subway mm -hmm. and I knew I had to deal with him when I got home but like we broke up as a team that night and mm -hmm. then after that all happened, we talked it out, and we were still together. We still do shows together. Right. Yeah. We spoke up as it happened in the moment, and it was terrifying, and it hurt, and I still remember the pain of it, but you're right. It's like, it always goes back to these, like, early days of, like, protest and, and civil rights where it's just like, this is the only, we need people to feel that's yeah. why we have to yell and scream and protest exactly. because it's you have to be emotionally affected and i feel like all people go through this whole process like i remember when everything started happening i was like frozen yeah and my yeah. husband one oh my gosh my husband turned to me because i was like sometimes i would get up from the news and go away mm -hmm. and like especially when it was like happening in santa monica and it was like a block away from the theater i like had yeah. so many issues going on watching you know people breaking through stores and stuff and i was like and i had to process it before i could speak to it mm -hmm. and he was like he turned to me and he he goes he goes should i just turn this off i don't know how you feel about all this and i got so upset because yeah. i was just like i was like what do you mean how do i feel about this i'm very upset and he was like but you're not talking about it and i was like oh my god you're right i'm keeping all of this inside mm -hmm. And then as soon as he like lit that fire under me, I was like guns a blazing. I was like, yeah. Ooh, let's talk about, let's get it off. Yeah. 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 And, and how, and it makes, it empowers you. It makes you feel strong. It makes you feel alive. It makes you feel better because you're fighting for yourself. If like, no one else, you're fighting for yourself. And uh, I think that is something that people just don't understand. When you speak up for yourself, it may feel, it may, feel horrible like um my, i i had i'll say my ex my ex would always talk about um the we had very differing opinions and the rioting that would happen um where people would riot and they you know oh they'd stop traffic okay. and <laughs> so, there's anyway but he they'd stop traffic and all the stuff and people are and they need to be and i would say the, the reason that these riots happen is because there's no voice. They are not heard. And if you don't feel like you're being heard, if you don't feel like you have a voice, you have to do something else. And that's what this whole movement is about, not having a voice. Why? Because we tell everybody, you know, this is just how it is. I'm sorry, but it's how it is. And then after it's, this is just how it is, you silence yourself. So you're like, ah, I'm not going to say this. And I even know this because even now when I'm like, I don't care about the repercussions, I still hesitate and say, oh, well, maybe, maybe I'll give them a couple of days to respond. I'm like, why? Yeah. I don't even perform with them anymore. And, or maybe I'll just, I don't want to like come across and I'm like, this isn't, that's not the way of change. Just say what it is that people who feel like they don't have a voice can't say that's that's the whole purpose of this yeah, yeah. i mean that's the that's the that was the turning point for me with like the rioting once i got past like the like oh my my neighborhood i walk in i was just like oh shit they they they're trying to make people feel on every level they can so it's like if yeah. you're a white business owner and and it's going to upset you that you have to go and claim insurance to get your shit fixed and get stuff, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to make you feel. And that's the point. Is exactly. 
to make you feel however it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, woo, big do. Okay, <laughs> let's go to something a little bit, um, a little bit lighter, I guess. Um, uh, I was talking to you before we started about this, so I just want to get your opinion. Um, the topic of um, the visual aspect of seeing a performer and the expectations you have of what's going to come out of their mouth uh, versus can we find a collective balance of how to treat it to move forward? Because I think a lot of theaters keep trying to micromanage how they're dealing with stuff. And this is a good one where it's like, you appear to be Spanish. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and your cultural experience is different than mine. You may have had a grandmother that had a very thick accent and to you it was always very fun and, and, you know, you'd love to emulate them. Like I emulate my mom. Mm -hmm. I make her sound Midwestern, but she's, she's straight up Boston-y, you know? <laughs> um, I don't know why she sounds that way, but um, of course, I mean, in my mind, of course, I want to see your experiences on stage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that you're doing a caricature, you know? Um, uh, I think addressing it as like, what is a caricature compared to like a stereotype compared to like your experience. Mm -hmm. it's a great conversation to have in classes. Um, but then when you let people loose on stage, it's like anything can happen, right? So taking responsibility for what, yeah. you're, what comes out of your mouth. But then there's the whole other thing where it's like, we started experiencing this on a um, smaller scale with people who didn't identify as necessarily female or male, maybe looked um, more male than they were female. And then this, the expectations of like the pronouns and what do I want to be called and how do they approach that as a conversation? Mm -hmm. it, I don't know if you notice, I definitely noticed because I had a lot of um, trans students, um, but like there would be a certain point where they would get very angry at people not asking, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, I get it, goes back again to like the like, when you don't know what else to do, you push so hard, it becomes this angry thing. Yeah. Um, you don't know how to tell them how to do it because it's a new mm -hmm. idea. Right, right, um, right. So it like starts from there, I think, this, this thing of like the visual thing we are seeing on stage, um, what is appropriate, what's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. and. I said before, and then I'm going to let you talk, so I, I shut up, but, like, the, um, I always tell my students, if you are not this race, then do not do that race's voice. It's not, it's not in your wheelhouse. It's not your experience. Um, but then again, it's like, I've talked to some of my friends who, I, I was speaking to one of my friends the other day, who's in the Denver community, who he's like, I grew up with, like, a, you know, a, 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 a kind of uh, Spanish speaking aunt or, a, you know, and we spoke Spanish in my house and they had a thick accent and mm -hmm. I felt like I had the right to do that on stage, which is mm -hmm. like, who am I to say? Right, right, uh, right. Experience. Yeah. Experience. But when you don't visually look like that, people don't know your backstory. Yeah. How, how do you go about it? Do you just yeah. say, I'm going to do it. And then you say, well, then just take ownership for it. Mm -hmm. um, that's my two cents. So what about you? <laughs> um, I, I also, I mean, I, I agree with, with that. I agree with taking ownership, especially with, for the choices that you make on stage. Um, and, and knowing that you are a voice, like we said, of this, this, per, this audience member and how they see themselves. And, and I also think that like when we talk about like accents and things, um, it's so touchy because it could be your experience. I think, you know, if we talk about like um, satire versus like a caricature, you like it, where you have caricatures within, I th the thing about satire is that it has to be so sharp and smart to make the point that you're making. And a lot of times it has to turn it, to turn the, the subject on its head. You know, you have to see that this is something that, uh, that this person is trying to like make bigger or make crazy. So in that, I think that 
if someone doesn't come at an accent or one of those or one of these like tropes as a as a character because an accent isn't a character you know like so if i'm doing an accent and i'm placing it on top of just a a, a stereotype i you know i think that the, even an audience member would feel that that is ingenuine that's the thing about audiences they're pretty smart you know what i mean like some of them are there's a lot <laughs> at alcohol um but uh, you can feel it's it's uh it's an interesting dance to make an audience member do the rest of the work i think that's the kind of stuff that i like like have an audience member give them a little bit and then let them do the rest of the work and they'll appreciate that so much more if you're playing into stereotype even if it's like your color if i play into uh some kind of stereotype that's a black stereotype i don't care who's in the audience black white whatever they could be offended by that even yeah. because i'm not a, i'm not respecting myself so if i'm respecting myself i'm respecting this culture and you are able to um empower that culture that's where i think that it's uh it's it's a better approach it is really really hard because in stand up you know that like in stand up you you come out and your first joke is usually how you appear and then it's kind of like how you break that down so your appearance has a lot to do with it but you know your appearance isn't your isn't always your truth so i i would say i mean like in a classroom situation it seems like the way i take it in a classroom situation is i'm always going through and i and if i ask if we're introducing each other, um, I'll have them tell stories about themselves. And also uh, in a ch children's situation, you know, I'm like, respect yourself, respect the audience. And you can only be called, you can only call this person what they want to be called, no matter what that is. And sometimes they want to be called something like pencil sharpener. I'm like, okay, pencil sharpener, <laughs> let's get it. You know, <laughs> but sometimes, and that's, I mean, I think that's just a way to, to help and teach. But I think this also comes to that whole idea that of being silenced and this culture of silence that we have, where how do we empower people to say in the very beginning of whatever, this is what I look like, but this is who I am, and this is what I'd like. Yeah. We silence people now. So we, as the teachers and as the people who are, doing this need to empower uh, them at these early levels, like level one, that's where a lot of bad stuff happens in level one. <laughs> or the pre-level ones, that's where you learn all the stuff about not speaking up. So right. like all those teachers, the ones that really need a lot, you know, those are the ones that are like you, cause you're coming fresh off of this. And there's only like this idea of what comedy is or idea of what like, like performances and just being true to um to respecting that this individual who has a whole life and a whole background and has pain and who has um uh, maybe trauma but also has love and has like they have expectations i think then you come out of that kind of stereotypical view or uh, portrayal of whatever this accent is. And I'm going so deep here. Wow, it's like <laughs> you're, you're onto something. I think that that's exactly right. Is like, wow, what a responsibility it is for like a level one teacher. But like, and please check your phone while I'm talking. About I'm, I'm trying to turn it off. Actually, you're blowing it's up. going oh. crazy. I'm not going to silence you. You got to <laughs> speak to you. Um, but it is like, oh my gosh, we have to we have to train people how to respect themselves mm -hmm. early on from level one. And that's the thing is like, oh my, we're, we're dealing with a lot of people who don't even inherently have that. Uh, so exactly. you are kind of like a therapist. Like I get called a, a comedy therapist a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I do, I've always delved into these kind of things Yeah. on a very minor, yeah. I mean, I used to, do bigger things. I had like an improv therapy class and everything, but oh, I, wow. um, it's not that interesting. 
uh, I didn't have credentials to do it by for a while. Um, but like when guys would come into scenes with the Minnie Mouse voice, oh, and I would always say to them after they, and it was always people I liked. It was always guys I liked, but I would, every single time after that scene, I would say, um, do you have any women in your life that you respect? Right. And they would go, what? And I go, who do you like? Who do you respect? Your mom? Do you got to, you know, and they would give me someone, you know, it's usually the mom or the aunt or the girlfriend or the wife. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I go, okay, well, does she speak like Minnie Mouse? Right. And I go, just soften your voice. And I was like, the only thing you need to know about playing a man versus a woman on stage is men are open, women are closed. Yeah. It's already problematic, but <laughs> you know, it's like, if you are a man, maybe that's just how you think about it. I'm going to play as if I'm uh, giving respect to this female character as if it is my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like real low ball. But those were like some of the yeah. things, but guys would be like, Ugh. or in private, like through email, I would mm -hmm. be like, give me a list. If they constantly played women in this weird way. Yeah. I'd be like, email me a list of five women that you respect. And it was always, you know, it was like, the stupidest list you've ever seen. Like Mother Teresa or something? Yeah, like, uh, you know, if they were trying to really impress me, it'd be like, Oprah, because she's, oh. like, she's such a strong businesswoman. And I'd be like, so then I would take whatever they would say, and then I would break down each one and ask mm -hmm. them why. Yeah. And it yeah. really, oh, it, <laughs> it really made some guys think. They just uh, Googled ladies. Yeah, well, <laughs> famous women that did important things. Um, I love the moment where they're like, because right, you yeah, like, yeah. They're like, even with, but you do the same thing with women. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. can list men faster than they can list women of here. Uh huh. Here. Uh huh. Yeah. Isn't that is that's the, like I'm saying? It's so deep. It's so deep. All of this stuff. I have to constantly stop myself from going, thanks guys, to a group of yeah. women. I'm constantly, I did it last night, and I was like, wow. I know, I like, know. I want to get in the habit, because I say, like, my husband and our female cat will be on the couch, and I'll come and I'll be like, they're my girls, you know? He, like, he thinks it's funny, like, you know? <laughs> um, But I'm like, hey, girl. doing that is be like, instead of being like, thanks guys, I'll be like, thanks ladies. Like, mm -hmm. maybe you should start doing Yeah. I mean, if something's going to come out, yeah. you should be like, thank you, gals. I don't know. I don't want to. Gals, like, we're back in the, the 50s. Like, <laughs> thank you, gals. <laughs> uh, oh, so the, I wanted to tell you about the new, my new thing, because, of course, now I'm like, oh, I'm accomplishing my goal. <laughs> Here's earlier than I wanted to because of every all the speed. Uh -huh. So when I was working with kindergartners, I... Did, I did filmmaking and animation and improv and theater with them. Um, and I worked with a ton of autistic kids. Yeah. All, in New York, it was a weird time when I was doing it with New York. Like, some kids didn't have to take the test, so they'd be put in regular classes. So we just had kids, like, every level, you know? Yeah. Um, and the district didn't care. So yeah. you kind of had to figure it out. And mm -hmm. I loved working with the autistic kids because, especially with the filmmaking, Mm -hmm. You'd be like, this is your goal, here are your lines, and they would be, I mean, six years old, they'd be like, one take wonders. I know. Yeah. Rules. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> here's my new thing. I started getting really excited about this idea of uh, doing very specific, all autistic, all on the spectrum adult yeah. improv classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, oh, that, I, no one's had this idea. Of course, everyone's doing it. There's tons online. Um, I got <laughs> a guy who teaches at Second City, um, mm -hmm. uh, Jay Suko, uh, hooked us yeah. up. Uh -huh. And I was like, hey, where do I go to get certified to teach adults? Because I want to, who with autism, because he does it at Second City, and he legit said to me, I've been looking for the same course. And I'm like, yeah, but you're already doing it. Yeah. You know, it's like, I, but that's so my, that's my next goal. I want to go get that's certified great. and trained. Oh. And I'm so into it. It's so fascinating to me. I know. Like, even, like, people who are very autistic, those are the mm -hmm. people I'm really interested in. Uh, because it goes back to that thing, it's like, why do I laugh at certain things? 
Yeah. And I was watching, I don't know if you'd been watching the um, Love on a Spectrum on Netflix. No, I haven't, but I've been told about it. It's so beautiful. Is it? Because I've been told about it. And I was like, I think someone told me a week ago and I'm like, I need to see that. They're like, yeah, Mirage, you need to see the show. I yeah. didn't even know something like that existed. You need to, because oh. the, the, it's like fascinating to watch people because they, the, basically the discussion is they get a lot of training and helps with social skills when they're kids mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not as adults. And a lot of these adults mm -hmm. never have a relationship and want to, mm -hmm. almost all of them exclusively are like, I would like a wife. I would like to treat her like a queen. I want, and you're just like, oh my God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the thing that's fascinating to me is like, well, as I'm watching it, I'm like, I love this. Why do I love this? Yes, all the, the sappy stuff. Yeah. But also I was just like, it's, to me, it's, it's kind of funny to watch people who don't understand even normal social cues yeah. and skills. And I was like, that's why I'm enjoying this a lot. And I'm like, it's not a bad thing. And I said to myself, you know what? A level one improv class for these people, man, like if they yes. can pretend to be other people, it's like the same thing when you're yeah. someone with a, a stutter, uh -huh. so you do improv, it's like, oh, it just goes away. Um, yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Giving them different bodies to be in, maybe they can like, Mm -hmm. learn faster and yeah I've, I've taught um in groups of just a, a mixture of different types of kids like you were saying um different levels of autism and it is so fascinating i have taught um public speaking i've taught improv um just acting and writing and all of it because it's such a laser focus on the, on one especially on on the level um where where like one of the children had their uh, parents with them or they had someone in the class with them the whole time, but they were so, I mean, if you give this person a something to memorize, they have it done by the end of the class. Yeah. And just these, these uh, being able to pick up on those strengths and the things that we like, that other people might, you know, lack or whatever, just to be able to pull all of those like gifts out is just so amazing. Cause you're just like, oh, look at this. And it's like blossoming and blooming. So, ooh, that's exciting. Yeah. Cause I think there's something to it, the whole idea of goals and rules, like they are obsessed with rules and following rules. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, I think there's having, I mean, I'm not claiming to have figured it <laughs> out yet, but I think there's something to the process they go through learning improv maybe yeah. um, to how we can maybe approach a new yeah. way of teaching. That's great. And that's a great way of like thinking of it too, because I always take like teaching um, and I'll be in a level one class or in some type of like acting class or something like that. Because I'm always, I never want to be that person that is so disconnected from the students that I work with that I don't know what's going on you know like this is back in the days when i worked in with mash or something you're like mash what is mash <laughs> i mean like you have to, i want to be like <laughs> connected i want to know what the kids are doing i want to like be able though to understand like if i give someone as a director if i give someone i'm like you have to be off book by x amount of days what that struggles like on the other side or any type of direction. I want to be able to be place myself in those positions. So that's such a great way of, of just pursuing T I mean, like just uh, not pursuing, but just ex executing teaching because it's like, you're a student of the student. Right. Right. right, right. That's how we have to be. That's how we're fluid and not rigid. And that's how we can listen and change. And, Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm very excited, and I'm uh, there's so many courses online right now, so I'm like, what well, is the time is now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, time is yeah. now. It's time right now. Let's get it. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I was like, this won't be an hour, and it's been an hour. I <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, please. I I love talking to you. Um, whatever 
you'd like to attack uh, to attack um it's great, it's great. yeah you I, start, start writing down questions too uh because yeah. i think if we if we do these like kind of like smaller questions yeah. uh-huh it can help people start to maybe build something i think so too because we yeah. can't do this alone right we everyone's got to pitch it absolutely how to absolutely. change this world of improv <laughs> And that's the thing that's, and that's part of it, right? It's like the journey of going through this. We have a goal, of course we have a goal, but sometimes the process of getting to that goal is the most important part of the whole thing. Yeah. The people that you meet on the battlefield, the people that you uh, like, you know, like you <laughs> coming in, like, you know, partnering up with great people who wanna make a change, who want to like, who care about other people. How else are you going to find those people that care about other people or care about the experiences of other people, especially when you don't have to, you know, anyone could just be like, I just want money and whatever. Oh, that's, a, that's what, that's what business is about in America is just like money, you know, but so it's not a prerequisite to actually have to you like care about the people that are giving you the money. <laughs> yeah. So that's a different type of person, you know? So, and that's great. Like having to be on the battlefield with people who have like mind and who want change and who care about love and life. And it's like your first month of doing improv for the first time. Yeah. yeah. How do I make that happen throughout? The throughout. <laughs> Oof. All right. I'm going to let you go. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad that we got to talk. You're Me too. beautiful. Oh, you are too. Oh, and uh, plug your show because I thought it was tonight, but it's next Friday. Yeah, it's next Friday. Um, and it's your late show tonight. And it's on uh, the Pack Theater's Twitch. And this Friday, or this Saturday, because it's not tonight, right. it's tomorrow, um, I am going to be interviewing. Um, so last week, we had. A, a beautiful group of Latinx women on our yeah, show. Uh, and so this week we'll have beautiful South Asian women who are going to be talking about their experiences in Hollywood and um, you know just check that out it's gonna maybe, be so great maybe we could do if you're doing a lot of those maybe we can get um, like a panel of people together that don't like we were talking about that maybe do not look Latin, uh, have Latin descent, yeah. like, but are. That's and great. We start to focus on what their experiences. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's all, so all of these experiences that people are just kind of like oh, everybody's good, right? Everybody's good. Everybody's yeah. quiet. Yeah, everybody's quiet. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Move on. And it, <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that. It's. No. <laughs> Not, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> all right. I'm going to stop our recording. Then okay. we'll say our fake goodbye to Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>